In the first part of this video, we saw how there were discrepancies between Sue Aitken and Phil Dye's accounts of how many trees the council had planted and where. We saw how the tree in Gloucester Road, which only Miss Aitken listed, was a replacement tree. And the two new trees in Elizabeth Close seemed to have replaced four previous trees with the council only acknowledging two of them. Now for Jubilee Drive or Jubilee Way as Sue Aitken incorrectly stated. This was probably the funniest episode of my research with me trudging along a leisure trail looking for trees which had been planted a kilometre away. Here are the two new Splendens Hawthorns in Jubilee Drive. And here is a stump. Again, the same trees from a slightly different angle. And the stump. I only noticed one at the time. The council claimed that two common hawthorns were removed because they were blown over. On Google Street, it is not possible to see how blown over they were, but you can see that two trees were removed. The council confirmed that the two windblown hawthorns were removed earlier in the year than the other trees felled in 2009. So in Jubilee Drive, two new trees, but not an increase in the number. Stay close now. This tree took a little searching for. I asked two local residents who were passing by and neither knew of a new tree. It is located to the rear of houses in Spay Close. And here is the obligatory patch of bare earth. As with Elizabeth Close, this was another narrow-leaved ash felled. I believe that this was the ash tree which was felled. A tree apparently felled for poor form. Morton Way has many saplings, but until I had additional information from South Gloucestershire Council, I was unable to determine which were the two or three trees planted during the winter of 2009-2010. Sue Aitken alleged that three Japanese rowans were planted there. Phil Dye, the council's tree officer, stated that two were planted. Here is one of the Rowans. Now 
noticed the evidence of two tree removals. Here it is again, the new tree and two patches of earth. The other new Rowan is further north. But then there is this small fir tree. In this location back in July 2009, this tree had been growing, as shown in Google Street. Strangely, no one is claiming this new fir tree, nor admitting to the other tree's removal. And here is the other new Japanese Rowan. Both the Rowans and the mystery fir are in the vicinity of Pentland Avenue. A local resident who wondered why I was filming spoke with me. He thought that this second new tree was a replacement for a tree cut down here. This untreated stump, which is full of new shoots, was felled because it was leaning at a dangerous angle, so the workman told him. What this indicates is more confusion about tree replacement. The sprouting stump is visible on Google Street, so I have not counted it as felled in 2009. But along the stretch of Morton Way by Pentland Avenue, there is physical and electronic evidence of four trees removed and three planted. The two hawthorns that the council admit to having removed were moribund, which means dying, coming to an end having little or no vital force left. Now the High Street. Here is the supposedly pretty Junebury. Notice how Wildings improved its external appearance. First, the new awnings around the time the silver birches were felled in January, and then in April, new paint. The bench had previously been located between the two silver birches, giving people a chance to rest in shade from a scorching summer sun. Now they have the chance to rest and get scorched. Two medium-sized planters were removed from the vicinity. I despise this farty little tree. I believe that it was chosen as the arboreal equivalent of a colourful hanging basket, for ornamental purposes only. Structural issues is the reason given for the removal of the silver birches in Phil Dye's reply to my Freedom of Information request.
here are my four suggested reasons. In fourth place, an uneven pavement caused by tree roots. I don't give this idea much credence. In third place, my original theory to fall in line with the national campaign launched by the Liberal Democrats to highlight poor pavement maintenance and high compensation payouts. I no longer believe that this was the primary motive, but rather a political benefit for the local party. In second place, part of further tarting up of Thornbury to assist with future good performance in the In Bloom competition. In my opinion, this would be a typical Thornbury form over substance, paint over the cracks, slap on the makeup attempt to over beautify the town. It might explain why Sue Aitken wrote to the local newspaper in her position as chairman of Thornbury and Bloom to defend the council's actions in the high street and to tell of tree plantings elsewhere whilst withholding details of the tree removals. In first place, economic pressure from wildings in a town which has to let signs all over its retail center. As probably the largest store in the high street Wildings would have been able to exert pressure on the council by threatening to relocate out of Thornbury unless the trees were removed. If Wildings had moved away, then the old town hall would have been added to the list of empty retail units. Anyway, let me try to summarize the confused situation regarding trees felled during 2009 and saplings planted in the winter. Regarding plantings, Sue Aitken originally suggested 10, but listed 9. Phil Dye responded that there were 7, but listed 8. Assuming that the tree in Gloucester Road was planted by the council, and the fir tree in Morton Way, then I say that there were at least 10. Those 10 trees replaced 13 trees felled in 2009-2010, I believe, so a net loss of three. Yet there are two important questions that come out of this. Firstly, what real control is being exercised over the tree planting tree removal program? Phil Dye, tree officer for South Gloucestershire Council, did not report the new tree in Gloucester Road. Sue Aitken, chair of Thornbury and Bloom, which works closely with the Thornbury Tree Strategy Group, which is led by Thornbury Town Council's tree warden, did not report the new tree in Spay Close, and she overstated the number of Japanese rowans planted in Morton Way. Neither of them reported the fir tree in Morton Way, nor were they able to manage simple addition. So no impartial observer can have proper confidence in the numbers and locations quoted by these key individuals. Secondly, are the reasons for tree removal valid? In this two-part video I have shown trees in foliage that have been felled for having died or been dying. Healthy looking ashes have been felled because of alleged storm damage or poor form, whatever that is. Trees have been removed because they were leaning at an angle yet other trees with serious or even dangerous liens are left alone. All around Thornbury there are stumps, as I have already reported, seeming to indicate an overzealous approach to felling. Near the leisure centre there is a volunteer-run tree recycling centre which turns felled trees into firewood and mulch and the immense volume of timber there seems to suggest that it operates on a factory scale. I will be reporting on that soon. On the positive side, I believe that Thornbury and Bloom's five trees were additions and not replacements. So it looks like a net increase of two trees, but whether a voluntary organisation should be redressing the inadequate replacement policy of the council is another matter. But then, there may be reasons for that, but unlike Miss Aitken, I will go into that.